Um, my name is Amy. I'm the Senior Community Relations Specialist for the Better Business Bureau. Um, and I have a friend with me today. Her name is Robin Putnam, and she is with the Office of um, Consumer Affairs and Business Regulation. And um, we're really excited to be here today. So thank you so much for, for inviting us and for attending, despite this freezing cold that we're having. Um, it's a little toasty in here, so I'm glad. Um, I'd like to start the program um, at how I start every program, which is just mentioning a little bit about um, uh, the Better Business Bureau and who we are and what we do and then letting Robin talk a bit about um, the Office of Consumer Affairs and Business Regulation because a lot of people have heard of BBB but aren't too sure about what we do and a lot of people as I've come to realize from Robin aren't even aware that there is an Office of Consumer Affairs and Business Regulation. So just briefly, um, a lot of people have heard of the Better Business Bureau um, and mainly that's because we've been around for 104 years and so the name has circulated Better Business Bureau, BBB, we've heard of about it and we may have even used um, our services as a complaint call center essentially utilized our services after we've had a problem with a product or a service or a business um, and we still do that we will take 100 phone calls from 100 individuals in one day saying my roof is still leaking and the roofer ran off with my money what can you do to help me track them down do this do that but we would much rather have 100 people contact us in one day and utilize our free programs and services and say, you know what, my roof just started leaking. What can you tell me about some of the reliable roofers in my area? You're less likely to fall victim to an unethical business um, practice if you just take a little bit of time to do a little bit of research ahead of time, and that's what we're here for. Um, our website, bbb.org, has over 5 million businesses that you can look up before you hire them or sign a contract with them or decide to do business with them. Um, and you can certainly access the website 24 hours a day, seven days a week, right at your fingertips, like you would access any website. Um, but you can also call our office and speak to one of our information specialists, Monday through Friday, 9 to 3, and say, I'm interested in finding a chiropractor in my area, or I um, need a physical therapist, or I want to take yoga classes and study at a, at a studio, or whatever it might be, doctors, lawyers, dentists, anything that you can imagine. Um, including the things that we probably all imagine, which is the roofers, the contractors, the plumbers. But online shopping now, we want to make sure that the, the online shop is legitimate and things of that nature. So don't hesitate to take a look at our website, bbb.org. It's, it's free 100% of the time. All of our programs and services are. And it just takes a little bit of time to do a little bit of research to give us a little bit of peace of mind before we go ahead and make those purchasing decisions. And beyond the 5 million business profiles that we have on BBB.org, we also have information on charity organizations as well. And that is through our Council of Better Business Bureaus that is located in Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. May I just ask a little favor? Sure. Um, I don't know about anyone else, but you're talking way too fast. <laughs> I am. Sure. Sure, ab absolutely. And don't hesitate if you have any questions throughout the program, um, raise a hand or, or shout it out and we're happy to answer any questions you may have regarding what we're talking about or something that you're hoping to hear as well. Um, so as I was saying, beyond the businesses that you can research and review, we have information on charity organizations as well, and we have information on everything that we're going to touch upon today times much, much, much more because there's just that much information out there about scams and identity theft and all of those tactics that the scam artists are using. So um, you can visit the website at your leisure and um, see what sort of um, scams are circulating in the community. Um, or, or you can sign up to receive a free email newsletter on behalf of the Better Business Bureau. And once a week you receive an email and all we do is ask you for your email address. And it'll have maybe the number one biggest scam that's circulating in the community right now, or a few scams that are going around that we feel the, the public should be made aware of. Um, but there's just so much, um, it's such a great resource tool. And it's right at our fingertips, of course, but don't hesitate to contact us and call and speak to one of our information specialists if you have questions as well. And uh, I'd like Robin to mention a little bit about um, the, agency that, the agency that she represents. Mm -hmm. Hi. Good morning. Thank you all for being here, or good afternoon, I should say. Um, so I'm with the Office of Consumer Affairs and Business Regulation, and I think I was here a couple of months ago. I recognize some of you. I was talking about <laughs> the home improvement contractors. So we have five agencies under our office, um, Division of Banks, Insurance, professional, professional Licensure, and Division of Standards, and the Department of Telecommunications and Cable. So if you ever have any issues, questions, concerns, could be about your cable company, could be a bank, about insurance, you can always call us. We have a, a hotline like the BBB, and it's actually on the, uh, the handout. 
It's Monday through Friday, and we have uh, specialists basically to, to answer questions for you, and you actually get a human being when you call. It's not press one, press <laughs> nine, and now you're speaking to someone in a different language, and you're going, where am I calling? Um, so it's, it's a really wonderful free um, thing to have for your communities. Um, so if you ever have questions, if you just call us. We have, you know, Monday through Friday, 9 to 4.30, we have specialists to answer questions. Uh, part of my job, basically, is to get out into the communities and give informational um, sort of lectures, just like this. A lot of, it could be about home improvement contractors, it could be about shopping rights, being safe online, um, division of banks, where they go out and give presentations. Um, it could be about really about anything, but unfortunately, our, my number one topic, a lot of the times, is scams and how to avoid them, what to look for, red flags. Um, so that's what we're mm -hmm. going to sort of go and talk about today. And as Amy mentioned, please, um, if you have a question, just let us know. Um, nine times out of ten, we can answer the question. If I can't answer the question, I'll get your information and find the answer for you. So thank you for having us. We really appreciate you taking the time. It is a little chilly and windy out. <laughs> <laughs> so we tend to start with the phone scams, and that's mainly because well, I personally find them to be the most annoying out of any of the scams because who wants to hear your phone ring nonstop and not have it be someone on the other end of the line that you'd like to speak with? Um, and also because we've been receiving phone calls for years and years and years from scam artists. And so sometimes I think we get a little comfortable in the tactics that have been um, going around for so long that we may not take into consideration that there may be some new tactics and that they're changing their ways a little bit. And um, we think that you know we're savvy to what the scam artists have been doing. And for the most part, we have been, which is why they're changing their ways. And so for years, we've been receiving phone calls from what I tend to call big red flags flag-waving scams, pretty outlandish. People would call and say, you won $20,000, or you owe $20,000, or you won a free cruise, or you won a free vacation, or there's a Nigerian prince with rubies and rubles in your name. Do this, that, and the other to collect it. And we might take a moment and say, oh, I'd love a free vacation. But we're going to take a step back and say, what are the chances that this is legitimate? How could I have won this? I never entered a raffle to begin with. And we've become savvy to those tactics. Or, or we've said to ourselves, I have to have $20,000 to begin with in order to owe it to somebody. So big red flags would go waving for the most part. And because, that they, because they had been circulating for so long, we became extremely savvy to them. So we're less likely to fall for those tactics that the scam artists are using. So they decided to change their ways. And what they do now is so interesting um, because they're now calling and they're impersonating legitimate businesses and legitimate organizations. And they're calling and claiming to be from our bank or our credit card company or our phone provider or our cable provider or the IRS, which is the biggest scam of the last few years that we'll get into. But what they're doing is they're taking this information. And sometimes they're, they're calling and they're just taking a chance that we happen to use the certain bank that they're calling on behalf of. And sometimes they're using this big old catch-22 beauty of the internet and finding the information online. And they're able to find our name and our address and our phone number and our age and maybe who our cable provider is or our phone provider. And then they put it together like a little puzzle and they call us and they make us feel very comfortable. They make us feel as though we're speaking to somebody from that actual agency or organization or business. And it's, it's tricky because they aren't using those big scare tactics like they used to. And they're not really laying it on too thick and laying that pressure on and making us feel desperate. They're having a very easygoing conversation with us. And they're starting by mentioning a lot of things sometimes about ourselves far before they ever get into asking us anything um, that we would have to reveal, like the big things that we know not to give away, which is the credit card information and the social security number. But by the time they end up asking, us for that information, we've already been in this very comfortable dialogue with the person on the other end, assuming that they really were calling from our bank or assuming that they really were calling from our cable company or something. And I know Robin's agency um, gets this a lot, that people um, we're falling for it. And it's really to no fault of our own, because why shouldn't we believe that the person on the other end is, is actually calling from our bank? Because 
they are calling now from our banks because they are closely monitoring our accounts. So the scam artists have become savvy to that. It's, it's so ironic that the credit card companies and the banks are closely monitoring our accounts because of the scam artists. And so the scam artists are now calling us and impersonating the credit card companies and the banks because they know that. And they think that maybe that time that they call will fall for whatever it is that they're saying. But would you agree that that's probably uh, one of the biggest phone calls that you receive? Is that the impersonation? Absolutely. because. If you think about it, if, if you use your credit card quite a bit, which you probably should be more so than necessarily your debit card, um, I don't know about you, but my, my credit card company watches me like a hawk. And I actually, starting last November, December, started traveling a lot more um, in, just in, in Massachusetts, giving lots of presentations. So what happened to me was I was in Acton giving a presentation, and I thought, oh, I should get some gas before I have to drive, to drive home. Well, I started to get gas, and my, they wouldn't take my credit card, and my cell phone rang. They wanted to verify that I was who I was and really in Acton because they knew I didn't live there. So I kind of appreciated that, okay, they're checking up on me. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it happens, it was in Holden, I mean, Cape Cod. So they know where I'm going all the time, which sounds a little weird and kind of someone's watching Big Brother kind of mm -hmm. odd, but they wanted to make sure that if I didn't pick up your cell phone and now I'm going, ooh, let's, let's, let's ch ch charge her credit card and I'm gonna go on a little credit card free um, spree. So they are watching us, but if you do get a call, I always, and then you suggest this too, if you get a call and they say, hi, this is you know, Robin, this is um, Chase, uh, Chase Visa, and we just wanna verify where you are because we notice some in, something going on with your credit card. Um, I highly suggest hanging up, even if it really is your credit card or your bank, because you don't know there are so many ways to scramble the information. So it makes it sound like if I'm a scammer, I am calling you from your bank. Um, hang up and call the real legitimate number. Pull the, your Visa card or your debit card out of your wallet. Mm -hmm. and, you know, maybe if it really is Bank of America calling to check, but call the real legitimate number. Um, if you haven't made that first step to call them, and they're calling you first, even if it is legitimate, it's best to just hang up. Um, and I've done it a million different times, and they're always like, yeah, thanks for calling back. <laughs> and they kind of chuckle, but I said, you know, there's too many fraudsters. How do I know if you're really calling me and you're not Ch Chase, or you're not the Visa company, or you're not Bank of America, or you're just some guy sitting in his living room? Did you have a question? Yeah. yeah. Um, you mentioned uh, uh, using a credit card and not so much the debit card. Here's my suggestion, and this is a personal opinion. Every time you use your debit card, you're literally pulling the money out of your bank account right now. Mm -hmm. So if someone ever scams that card, and unfortunately we've all been hearing about credit card skimming devices constantly in the news, um, it's a little bit more challenging to get the money back into your, your actual physical bank account. Mm -hmm. So let's say, I, let's say I scammed your card, and all it takes is a smartphone with a camera take the front and back picture of your card. I know it's scary, but it can happen. It happened to my mom. And her, her account got drained in about an hour. And luckily it was, um, it was only, I, I, I wanna say about two or $3,000, not 20,000, but two or $3,000 is still a lot of money. Mm -hmm. And it took nine weeks, 10 weeks to get the money back into her account. Mm -hmm. she, had to, it, she, she had to fit, uh, file a police report filed a lot of reports with her bank. Um, it, was, it was a very long and tedious process. My only thought is if, you, if I'm gonna get scammed, I'd rather my credit card, because if they max my credit card out, five or $6,000, it's not coming out of my bank account. Mm -hmm. And I can still, I, yes, I'm still gonna be really upset, I'm gonna freak out, I'm gonna have to file a police report and a report with the, the credit card companies, but at least while that's being settled and, and dealt with, I'm not, going to have to write a check for $9,000 to Visa, mm -hmm. or MasterCard, whatever the credit card is. Mm -hmm. um, but while that's being done, also I can still keep going and pay bills because no one's atta actually attached my physical money in my bank. Um, and it happened to a girlfriend of mine, uh, much younger, but she couldn't pay her rent for three months. So she had to have a letter from her bank, uh, a police a copy of the police report for her landlord to accept her not to pay her rent for three months. Otherwise, she was going to get evicted. So she couldn't pay her rent. She couldn't pay her car payment, uh, and all of the other car payments. So if you if you if this happens and you can't 
pay any of your payments because your, your bank account has physically been drawn out from, what happens? You, you might have, you might be, um, credit, card, credit companies might start calling you, why aren't you paying your bill? Mm -hmm. You might have a debit, your, your debit card might say, well, hey, what's going on? It's, we don't want that to happen so you can at least keep paying your bills. I mean, it is still, yeah. it's still not easy and it's gonna be a pain right. to deal with a credit card, but at least you can still go about your day and do your regular life well, mm -hmm. that's being figured out. Well, that's it. The money isn't immediately extracted from your account if it's a credit card that's been um, taken advantage of as opposed to the debit card. Like Robin was mentioning, it's immediately extracted from your account. And it's not that you don't get it back. It just takes a bit longer <laughs> to get that money back into your account. And it could take up to two months um, just to begin with. Um, right here. So <clears throat> actually, if you receive really any phone call from any financial institution, you should just Yes, 100% of the time, and I know that this probably sounds unrealistic for someone to do, but 100% of the time, if I get a phone call that's coming in, no matter who they're claiming to be a representative of, I hang up the phone in whichever manner I would like, and I hang up the phone, and I find the number that I know for a fact is associated. And, you know, one of two things can happen every time. I'm going to call and say, I just received a phone call from someone claiming to be from Bank of America, and they said there was a discrepancy with my, with my account, and they're going to say, yes, that was us, thank you for calling us back, or they're going to say, no, that wasn't us. And then that, you know, just solidifies for me that I did the right thing because it was a scam artist. And not only am I solidifying it for myself, but then I'm also alerting the bank or the credit card company or whoever it is I'm speaking to that there's a scam going around with someone impersonating them. So it really works in a multitude of ways. And it's all about peace of mind. The only way that we can ever be even just 1% sure that we're speaking to someone um, that we should be from an actual business or organization is if we're the one that's, that's made the call. And someone could call me and they can do this uh, and it would scare me, but they could say, oh, you're Amy Schramm and this is your address and this is your social security number and this is your account number. They could say these things to, make me comfortable and validate that they are who they are. And I still, I would be a little nervous if they had that information, but I would still hang up and call, no matter how convincing they sound. Because that's really how easy it is that they're, that they're um, getting us. Mm -hmm. How much are you responsible for if somebody scams you on a fake credit card? Are you responsible for any of the, any of the charges? I think it's, it depends on the bank, but I think on average it's like $50. Am I yes. correct? My visa actually has a zero fraud liability, so a lot of some of the some of the big credit card companies are saying, you know what, we're not even going to charge you the fifty dollars, um, because some of the some of the charges they are so they can be so outlandish and so out of the, out of the ordinary. It could even be fifty dollars, but it could be fifty dollars in Utah. Well, I don't live in Utah, and I haven't I don't even think I've even traveled to Utah. Mm -hmm. So if I call my visa, say, hey. Um, I can verify, and this is how I can verify it, because I gave a presentation here and in West Weymouth, and da 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 I can verify that I was here, and no, I have not spent $50 in Weymouth. So that's, that's what happens a lot of times. You just call them immediately. You should call them immediately, but mm -hmm. um, a lot of, just call your own credit card company, but uh, just to verify, because sometimes it's zero, and it, but they're not, they, you can't go over 50. Did you have a question? Yes, I was impressed by that phone call you got when you were standing at the gas station pump. Did you hang up and call? I did. <laughs> I did. I did, actually. I, I did. Um, and I just got one from AAA. Um, I got it from my visa, and I hung up. I said, oh, thanks so much. Um, I, don't, I don't give my information over the phone. Mm -hmm. Unless I know I'm calling the credit bureau because I want to you know, get my credit checked, fine. Unless I'm calling Visa. And they were very nice. Thanks so much for calling us back. Um, we really did call you. We wanted to just verify, why are you, why are you in Western Mass? You don't live there. Um, are you moving? What's going on? Um, so I actually kind of, um, when you ever travel out of state or travel out of the country, you should call your cards and say, I'm doing a travel, um, and just let them know, because they'll put a red flag, and if they see something, oh, you're, is she really in London? They'll shut everything off. Mm -hmm. But what I did for myself is I said, look, I'm now going to be traveling quite a bit in Massachusetts. Uh, all the time. Um, I've, in the last year, I've given over 150 presentations from West Springsfield to Cape Cod. So I let them know. I said, look, 
I'm gonna be doing this, so please, there shouldn't be any red flags, but if you see something in Maine, Vermont, New Hampshire, Rhode Island, I don't travel to those areas for work. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes, I was a victim of fraud recently. I, I got on my personal computer and the big uh, pop-up came on that I was being attacked by a virus, mm -hmm. a Trojan virus, and I should call Microsoft. Mm -hmm. They were posing as Microsoft people. Sure. I called that number and the man said it would, he would remove the virus, but I had to pay him $500. Yes. And so I fell for it, and I actually had an e-check drawn to me. And then I had to go to my uh, fitness class, and I talked to my fitness counselor, and he said it was a scam. Mm -hmm. He came over, and he, you know, he did a reverse lookup on his number, mm -hmm. and uh, and they said it was a scammer. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I went to my bank, and I I had to, you know, put a stop payment. Mm -hmm. Great. Good. So there's oh. And so and I got rid of it, and I went to the police, and, I, and they said, oh, cyber crime is on the increase. Yes. Mm -hmm. You should be very well aware of any pop-ups that come on your computer or on your, your laptop, your tablets, your phone, any pop-ups. Anybody saying they're calling from Microsoft, oh, we think there's something wrong, hang up. Mm -hmm. Unplug your computer, hang up, shut it down. Um, you can do a reverse lookup, um, anywho.com, and click on reverse, and just look up the phone number. What is it's called anywho.com. A-N-Y-W-H-O. Um, dot com, or you can Google. Google is phenomenal. Google the phone number, type it in, and push enter. And if it's fraud and scam, which I'm doing constantly, um, it'll pop up. Anybody who's commented on it, oh, it's a scam call, just ignore it. So you can either go to any who, or you can go to Google, and it's just a great way to see numbers. Yeah. You just don't know where these the numbers are coming from. I mean, I, I use AAA as an example because they literally just called me last week. Um, to renew my membership, but the call came in it, from the West Coast, which I was like, uh, I don't have a West Coast AAA, why are they calling me, this is crazy. So I called a AAA number on my little card that they sent me. I said, you know, did someone just call me? She's like, oh yeah. I said, well, she called, like, it looked like it was coming from Los Angeles. Well, that's another call center. Well, I said, I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna give her my credit card information if it looks like it's coming from Los Angeles or wherever, but I, so I, did renew over the phone, but I didn't do it when they called me because it looked fishy to me. Mm -hmm. um, even though it was realistic, I just for me, I thought, I'm, I don't know if this really is AAA. If it's AAA, why are they calling me from LA? Mm -hmm. Why not Weymouth or somewhere in the Boston area? I want to just touch upon, I'm sorry, one moment. Yeah, I, I mean, just go to a AAA office yes. and, and sign up there. Exactly. Yes, exactly. I, I do want to touch upon um, two things that, that you had mentioned. Um, First things first, acting as quick as possible is the, is the best thing that we can do. And I, even when we think it's quick, it could probably even be a little bit quicker. The moment we think that there could be something that has been tampered with, with our bank account, our credit card, or, or um, anything of that nature, call the bank immediately, call the credit card company, call one of the three major credit bureaus, and we'll get into that in a little bit, um, in, in a little bit more detail in a little bit in terms of the credit bureaus. But call them immediately. It could be nothing. It could be just that we thought that we gave some information away over the phone when we shouldn't have. But peace of mind, again, is everything. And you're going to call and say, you know what? I think there's a chance someone got a hold of my information. Or I may have given away some information I shouldn't have. Can you just put a fraud alert on my account? And it's so simple to do. And it's really one of the only ways that we can make sure that we're protecting ourselves um, if in that chance that we have given something away. So just act as quick as possible. And then I want to mention, um, you had brought up that you had a pop-up come up on your computer, and this happens to all of us. When you're connected to the internet, we have pop-ups come up, or we have emails, of course, coming in and out. And similar to the phone, the biggest phone scams, with our, which are those impersonation phone scams, are the email phishing scams. And they're emails and pop-ups that look official. So obviously, they don't sound official like the phone, but they look official. They have that header. They have that logo. They have the format that would typically be sent from the legitimate company. Comcast was uh, misrepresented. Bank of America was misrepresented. Verizon, UPS, FedEx, the Better Business Bureau at one point was being um, 
spoofed. And these are emails, again, that look like they're coming from these agencies. And you open it, and it says something like, dear valued customer, or dear member, or maybe your name. And it will say, you know, we're changing our pricing policy for next year. Click on this link to see how you'll be affected by it, or something like that. Or if you're um, a business and you receive an email that looks like it's coming from the Better Business Bureau, and it says, a dear accredited business or dear business owner, there's been a complaint filed against you. Click on this link to handle the issue. You're going to get a little nervous probably and click on that link pretty quickly. And that's what people have been doing. And similarly to those pop-ups, like the one that you had mentioned, looked like it was from Microsoft. I had a gentleman tell me, I've been with BBB for five years giving these programs, and I tell this story at every program. This was probably four and a half years ago. This gentleman in Rhode Island told me that he had a pop-up appear on his screen, and it looked like it was from Microsoft. And it said, dear, you know, or, or it just said, we've detected a virus from your computer. But it had that logo, that Microsoft logo that everyone knows. It said, click on this link, and we'll scan your computer for you. And he clicked on the link. And seemingly nothing happened, but within two hours, he received a phone call from his credit card company asking him if he made a $20,000 purchase over in California. And he got lucky, and I obviously say that, use that term very loosely, but I think he got very lucky because not only did the scam artist get a hold of his personal information, but they tried to use his credit card and they tried to do something outlandish with it. So they tried to do something that would be obvious to the people that were watching his account and monitoring his account, not only did they try to do something 3,000 miles away from where he lives, they tried to make a $20,000 purchase that was unusual to his spending pattern, and it was the credit card. So it could be found by the credit card company, they could contact him, and he could say, no, that was not me, and the transaction could be canceled. In the off chance that this outlandish purchase bypassed the people that were monitoring, and it ended up on his statement and it went through, he then would notice a $20,000 purchase and say, wait a second, I obviously didn't do that. And so because it's so crazy and big, and they know that we're going to notice this, the scam artists don't do this very often. They get a hold of our information, and they, when they start to use it and utilize it, they make small purchases here and there. And they do that because they know not only is the bank not likely to notice it as unusual or the credit card unlikely to notice it un as unusual, but if it pops up on our statement, we may be unlikely to notice it as unusual. And it's not going to stick out to us as much as these big outlandish purchases would be. And not just that, but we're probably unlikely to even do something about it if it's small. How many times have we in this room, someone in this room, seen a $1 service fee or charge and said, oh, it's just a dollar. If it's there next month, I'll worry about it then. Well, if a million people saw that $1 um, sta statement charge and said, you know, I'll worry about it next month, then whoever put it there just made a million dollars. And that is how these scam artists work. I think we usually think that if we're going to get scammed, it's going to be big. Why? They're going to make it worth their while, right? Why would they scam me out of two or three dollars? But it's because we're not the only ones. We're one of a million, one of a few thousand in a day that are receiving the phone calls, receiving the emails, and that's just how it works. And so unless we're really, really closely monitoring our statements as they come in, monitoring our bank statements as they come in, monitoring our credit card statements and bills as they come in, and really cross-referencing. Hold on to your receipts for the month and just cross-reference your receipts with your statement and just make sure. It's easy to be manipulated because I share a credit card with my husband and if I see a five, ten, fifteen dollar purchase, I'm not very likely to ask him what it is that he, you know, had purchased if I realize it wasn't a purchase I made. But if I see a $500 purchase, I'm certainly, you know, it's going to stick out to me and I'm going to ask them what it was and wonder if it was a gift or where it's hiding. And if it's not, I'm going to call the bank. And that's just how it works. So we have to really, really, really closely monitor those accounts. And it sounds like something that we've been doing for years and years. I'm sure everyone in this room does it now and has been doing it for years. But nowadays, um, it's, it's pertinent that we're still doing it and really, really thoroughly looking. And then taking it a step further, and Robin always recommends this, um, one credit check a year, at least one credit check a year from each of the three credit bureaus. And, and annualcreditreport.com is where you really recommend people go to. Yeah, annualcreditreport.com. It's the only free, literally free, mm -hmm. uh, government sanctioned place to go to check your credit report. Um, you can go on January 1st and check the first one, uh, Experian. 
It's a very boring read, I assure you, but make sure things that are on there are really supposed to be on there. Is your name spelled correctly? Is your date of birth? Where you live? Where you've lived in the last five years? Credits, credit that's open, credit that's closed, mortgages. Um, if anything looks out of the ordinary, there's your red flag. But if everything is fine, then that's no big deal. In four months, go back online to annual credit report and do the second one. Four months later, now you're at the end of the year, check the third one. Mm -hmm. If nothing, if, no, if there's no red flags and everything is fine, now you've checked all three credit reports for free and you can be sure that nothing, nothing has gone awry. Mm -hmm. Then January 1st, start again. If something, is, if something pops up, like your name is now misspelled, misspelled, or maybe your date of birth has been slightly changed, or there's a new credit card. Did you really sign up for that Discover card? Mm -hmm. You need immediately call, let's just say it's Experian, and say, you know, I don't, have a, um, I don't have a Discover card. My name, I just noticed my name is misspelled and my date of birth has changed since last year. Um, and I've noticed this on my re report. So they will run, walk you through exactly what they will need from you, but they will then call the other two credit reporting agencies for you and say, uh-oh, Mary Smith and Acton's had an issue. Uh, someone, something's going on, you need to, go through her accounts. But it's mm -hmm. just, it's a very easy, it's, it's boring, but it's, it's a very easy way to keep track of what's going on in your life financially. Um, and a lot of people don't, they just sort of think, eh, who cares, why should I do this? But you never know if someone has stolen your information and it can happen so quickly and so easily nowadays because everybody's online and no one cares and it's, it's just people throw things out into the trash instead of shredding things, which is a huge issue. Um, mm -hmm. My mom is 73 and I'm still on her. You should shred everything that has your personal information, even the back mm -hmm. of your catalogs. Mm -hmm. Let's just say, I'm, not, I'm using LLB as just as an example. I am not saying they're scammy. But if you regularly buy something from, say, LLB and they're always sending you their catalog, every once in a while, not every company, your account number will be on the top of your name and address on the back of the, um, the catalog. So if a thief goes through your recycling bin and says, ooh, Mary Smith, and she lives at whatever in Acton, and she's, here's her account information. She, he can now pose as you and call up, call up L.L. Bean and start buying some information for you. So cut mm -hmm. out the little back, the, your name from the back of a catalog and shred that. Mm -hmm. You should not be throwing anything out. You shouldn't be using a Sharpie. It's not, it's not good enough. Yeah. There are still dumpster divers who will go the morning of trash day because people will do it at night, they'll put the trash out for the trash guy who comes at six o'clock in the morning. But what they don't know is the dumpster diver will come at 5 a.m. and say, ooh, let's, let's grab all the trash bags. And thinking, knowing that a lot of people won't shred things, mm -hmm. and it's not enough to get the shredder that just goes like spaghetti shredding. Um, you've gotta do the cross one, and it's gotta be the tiny, tiny, it's almost like grain of rice size. Um, and they're rough, rough, excuse me, the machines are roughly the same, price for the minute one, um, but you really, you cannot just simply throw it out mm -hmm. because there's too many people who are, they're bored and they will take all of your trash bags mm -hmm. just for fun and they will link them all together and figure out, oh, I now know what your credit card information is. Mm -hmm. And the same goes for your empty pill bottles. You've got it, I know it's a pain, but get your name off of that, that pill bottle. Get the, the, get the whole um, thing off of it, the label, and shred that as well. Anything that has your information, old statements, even if your bank has changed from this bank to this bank to this bank, um, shred everything. If someone has passed away, it's got to be shredded. It's got to be shredded. It's got to be shredded. It mm -hmm. cannot, nothing can go into the trash anymore. Did it's you have a question? Or <laughs> it pops up again. <laughs> it's one of those tedious things that, that we may not think to do regularly, but we just we just need to, and, and we all do. You know, I, I had like 16 pounds of paper I shred, and I brought it to a store that, that has a shredder, and it cost me like $4.25, because I, I didn't have a personal shredder. I will be purchasing one when I move into my new home soon. Um, and it's, it's like $20 for like a tabletop shredder or something like that, and it's worth it. You can also find shredding days in your town as well, um, and in your community. There's a website, it's called Shredding. You can Google Shredfest. Shredfest. I did, I did this for my mom, Shredfest 2016, um, and it was in Littleton, and it was uh, hosted by an, a law office. Mm -hmm. So, and then I looked up the company who was doing the shredding, and it was reputable. So we went up there. We had um, nine bankers boxes full of old information, and my father had recently passed away, so I wanted to make sure all of that was gone. 
and it was great because we got rid of everything in under five minutes and they had a camera inside the machine to watch everything get shredded. Mm -hmm. So peace of mind, and she, she kind of thought, maybe we should have a bonfire. I said, I don't know, we're not having a bonfire in the backyard. But did mm -hmm. you have a question? Transfer station has a shredding machine. Great. And it costs nothing, but you're not allowed to start shredding at 3.30 in the afternoon. Okay, <laughs> good to know. Okay. If you just Google shred in your town, shred fest, AARP sponsors them a lot. Mm -hmm. um, different different councils will, will uh, sponsor them. Different different law firms will, will uh, mm -hmm. sponsor them. But if you just Google it, uh, Shredfest 2017, Massachusetts. And this goes all kinds of things will pop up. And this goes for electronics as well. So th obviously you can't shred electronics, but disposing of electronics, shred any, shred papers and documents and receipts. Unless I paid for something with cash, all my receipts get shred, even if it only has the last four of my credit, just to be safe. Um, but electronics as well, a lot of the time, a lot of times um, they have to be professionally um, wiped. We might think, oh, we've deleted everything off of this phone and now we can go and recycle it or, or trade it in somewhere. But there's a proper way to do it. And I personally don't know how to do it and I'm not sure I have any friends that know how to do it either. There's a, there's a very, very, very technical way to do it and there are um, companies that will take care of that for you, professional companies that will do it. Mm -hmm. You said earlier, if you think you've been scammed, to call the debit business bureau and have you put a flag on, excuse me, on my account. What does that do? Um, red flag on my um, I don't... Yeah, I don't think I mentioned that. I'm not sure. Maybe there was just a, a, mis, a miscommunication, but that's fine. So if you have done business with a business and you've had an issue with a business, let's say you hired a, a roofer and your roof is still leaking or your roof caved in after you hired them and you want to file a formal complaint against them, you would contact the Better Business Bureau and then what we do is we contact the business for you. So we serve as the middleman. And these are for legitimate businesses. So a, a business that would have a business profile with us, or if they don't, then we would generate one for you, uh, for them. We would um, file a formal complaint against them, or, or you would do that. And that complaint would be displayed against that business or on that business's profile for three years. And then it helps the people behind you as well. But call us and we essentially, that's what we do. We facilitate the dialogue between the consumer and the business. Now, when it comes to scams and scam artists and, you know, unfortunately, they're not all um, easy to track down or that, that's something that would be a legal thing and we would point you in the right direction of um, the Attorney General's office and then they would handle something like that. But legitimate businesses that you've worked with absolutely contact us. Mm -hmm. I, I won the amount of money, oh, good. and he was supposed to show up in court, and he didn't. He was in fault, okay? Which, but she said, in order for me to collect, I had to get a sheriff to serve on this and that. But he moved around a lot. He mm -hmm. to, to Florida and back. Mm -hmm. Then I saw that he was still doing business and acting, using an act and address, mm -hmm. which is where Verizon is, the parking lot, ah. which he still has in the telephone book. Now, I hmm. think he really has left the area. What do I do about that? That's I mean, I interesting. Have a court order saying he's default, I, he owes me money. Yeah. That's interesting. It's very possible for someone to be doing business under one name and then when they realize that people are catching on to their unethicalness. Oh, it's the same exact name? Oh, then it should be very easy to track him down. I would contact, um, probably, did you mention the Attorney General's office? Contact them? I did, and you said I've talked to a person, but I was going into surgery. I can give you the information afterwards. Yeah, yes. yeah. I think I will try it because. Um, I'll take your information down as well, because I can see if that gentleman is actually registered. Not a gentleman. <laughs> well, I'm being nice. <laughs> I'm gonna, I'd, I'd like to see if he's actually registered I through our office. Also, he was using another person's, um, you know, license number you Okay, used. sure. Mm. So he's really definitely legitimate. He's a bad he, and he, yeah. I used him because he lived in Acton, and he was a, a school teacher. He retired, and I thought, oh, okay, okay, I'll give him the business. Well, he gave me the business. Wow. Well, Ashley, wow. let, let me get your information. 
and all of that information so we can kind of look into it and see what we need to do. Yeah, there are a lot of resources if you if you have issues with these businesses and I mean legitimate. So he was posing as a legitimate business, of course, and probably still doesn't even realize the damage that he's done. And so he probably doesn't realize that there's a chance that you would be getting in touch with him again. But Attorney General's Office, Better Business Bureau, the Federal Trade Commission, all of these resources are free. So don't hesitate to contact and, and let these agencies know and these organizations know the issues that you've had. And hopefully they can help you get to the ultimate resolution that you're looking for. And if by chance we just can't do that or they can't do it, at least there's going to be some sort of mark on that business in some way. It will be on file so then if anyone's ever looking for this roofer or this contractor or whatever it is and they're contacting these agencies in a precautionary manner we can say you know what we've had some complaints against that particular business and this magistrate that we went in front yeah. of in the county court she said it's on the books forever it doesn't go away mm -hmm. and that he's also every year he does it he's charged an interest fee charge against it. interesting so he's well whatever i mean I, that's I, a good I was just stupid that I didn't go after it, but I had other problems I had to take care of. Well, that's it. That's what happens. It happens to all of us. You know, we get busy. We have so much to do. And it's tough sometimes to keep track of all the things we need to keep track of. And as long as, you know, just get back to it when you can and, and, and reach out. And um, that's really all what you can do, you know. And in regards to that, if you're going to be doing contracting work in Massachusetts, whether it's someone who's putting a new roof on, doing structural work to your home, uh, they actually have to be registered through our office. So if you're thinking about mm -hmm. doing work, contracting work on your personal home, not your vacation home, you should call our, our hotline, which is on, on this handout, um, and we can look up that contractor's information. If Is he or she registered? Ha are there any complaints against that person? Are there any lawsuits against that person? Obviously, it's a little too late in this instance, but we might still be able to help you, so I'll mm -hmm. get your information afterwards. But if you're going to do work you should always call her office, our office, and try to get as much information, Attorney General's office, to get information about that contractor or a person who's doing work on your home, um, whatever it may be. If they're going to be doing, if you're going to have a plumber in, make sure they're, they're the, your plumber's licensed mm -hmm. and up to date. Mm -hmm. uh, electrician, make sure they're licensed and up to date. It's not just some guy who's fly by the seat of your pants. And chances are, if they're not reputable, somebody else has had an issue before you and done the same thing. So there's probably that information out there. Did you, Did, oh, oh you had a I'm sorry. <laughs> we'll go this way. <laughs> to the prescription bottle, what can they get off of that? Sometimes on the prescription bottles, uh, is your, from what I've heard, I haven't looked at mine lately, it can be your um, health insurance number or your doctor's information. So this is awful. There could be. Someone could call your doctor's office and I could pose as you. Hi, this is Mary Smith calling from Acton. I just want to, I had some questions about my medication and, and go further and get more information from the doctor's office regarding who you are, where you live. Mm -hmm. um, so that's all on the bottle, but that's all public information anyway. Your name and yes, address. Yes, but are sometimes on. you can, then you can have a scammer who can break into the office and get Medicare mm -hmm. numbers, Medicaid numbers, right. Social Security numbers. There have been people who have broken into offices. Uh, um, not just regular doctors, pediatricians offices and, and gotten the social security number of the person, whether it's a three-year-old or a 65-year-old, um, and then wreaked havoc on that person's personal identi identification. Mm -hmm. So it's best to, to rip it off. Yes? I'd just like to add on the medication bottle, your address and your name will be on it. Therefore, if you or someone else was to find that bottle, mm -hmm. they would know you probably have additional medication at your house, mm -hmm. and they might want to come and break into your house yes. and get more. Exactly. Yes. That's a really uh, uh, good point. Yes. That to me, that would scare me more <laughs> more than anything because it's so it's so possible. It's so it's so easy for someone to do. They have that information right there. That would make me very nervous. So that was a great and point. In regard to that, um, if you're still going to be paying for things using checks, um, a lot of people don't want to hear this. It's a good idea if you're still leaving paying for things with checks. Don't leave it in your mailbox like you're paying your visa bill with a, just a regular mm -hmm. check. It should go into what the blue box that's almost impossible to get into or going to actual physical mail, uh, the post office, because now you're leaving so much information right in your mailbox. And it is against the law to actually go into the mailbox unless you're the, better, the, the mail carrier. But, but, but mm -hmm. yeah, exactly. But now you've got your bank routing number, your mm -hmm. account number, your name, address, your signature. Sometimes you have phone numbers. Um, all of that information, boom, can be stolen in three seconds. 
And now that we're going into the holiday season and now tax season, everybody's paying for their bills and people are gonna get a lot of information coming from, if you have savings accounts, you have bonds, you have all of your tax information is slowly gonna get start coming into your mailbox in the next month or so. So you can get your taxes ready for your accountant. You should be watching your mailbox like a hawk mm -hmm. because all of that information is right there, big thick envelopes, who knows if you've got an account with B. Mellon, if you've got an account here, here. Anybody going, well going through right after your mailbox, like your mail carriers come through, ooh, let's steal that information. Um, it's just you've got to be very careful what's left in your mailbox. Mm -hmm. And this goes along with everything that we've been recommending in terms of it's the little, little, little things that we can do daily to protect ourselves. Mm -hmm. Not just throwing things in the trash before we shred them or leaving things in your mailbox with the red flag waving saying there's something important in here. It's the little, little, little things that we can do that are going to protect us because the truth is it's very, very simple and easy for our personal information to be taken from us. But because it's so simple and easy for it to be taken, it's just as simple and easy for us to protect it. It's just about being extra diligent and really, really, really taking the time to properly secure and, and um, all of our documents and things like that before we're disposing or, or putting them out there. Mm -hmm. um, now that all the credit cards have chips in them, isn't that much safer? It is supposed to be much safer now that the credit cards have the chips in them. So um, over in Europe, they've been using this uh, for a very, very, very long time. But in Europe, what happens is they've had credit cards with chips in them, and there's a pin associated with the chip. So every time you use the card with the chip, you're supposed to type in a pin number, a special pin number just for that one card. We don't have that piece to it yet, I don't think. Most of us don't. And so we're, about, we're halfway there. We're getting there, though. I think in the next few years, it's supposed to be um, implemented that that pin number will be associated. But the chip alone is supposed to be safer as well. The technicalities of it, I'm not sure about. Um, but I know that it is. We're, get, we're getting there. <laughs> you also have to be very careful that um, we still have the magnetic stripe on the back of your card. So that's really what they're going after still. Mm -hmm. um, so yes, the chip is definitely much safer. But the problem is we still have, we'll probably have that magnetic stripe for another two years. Um, so you still have to be very, very careful of where you're using your card, what you're, it's gonna sound weird, but when you're putting your card in the machine, is there anything wobbly? It's, does it, is, are they the right colors? Um, mm -hmm. it's, that's a whole other presentation that I give, but you just gotta be very careful. So you never know if there's gonna be a skimming device. So if you are constantly monitoring your own accounts, Go through your bill when it comes through. Does everything look fine? Great. If there's that $2 charge at CVS, and you never go to CVS, you go to Brooks Pharmacy. That should be your red flag. Mm -hmm. uh, because their credit card skimming devices, they were just two were found, I can't remember which town. A couple oh, yes, uh, Target. Yeah. yeah. They were also found at Primark in downtown Boston. In Walmart. So, Walmart. I mean, they're, they're being found <sighs> everywhere. They've, they've even been found inside the banks. So. Mm -hmm. You just never know where they are, so if you're monitoring your accounts like a hawk, if you can, if you do online banking, check every couple of days. It sounds really, I sound paranoid, but it's so easy. Um, you could be- scammers read the chip too? No, they're reading the magnetic stripe. Just, because so the magnetic stripe so if you're is, using the chip, then you don't have to worry about a skimmer. No, that's not true, because if the skimming device, you, because you still, have, <laughs> you still have the magnetic stripe. Yeah. 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 So but if you're not running it through the, the thing, how does it skim it? That's a good card. It's reading. Strip. Yeah, it's reading. Even the though your information is yeah. there and it's set up to extract it. Yeah, it's not necessarily that it has to scan the whole strip. It's that the strip is there yeah. and it's reading the information from it. And to be honest, that's why I personally tend to use my credit card more often than my debit card, especially if I'm using an ATM machine or a gas station that's sort of out of the ordinary or not a, uh, an ATM machine that's not attached to a bank. It doesn't mean that you can't be in the bank and somebody couldn't have implanted a skimmer because it can happen, but it's a little less likely to happen. And I just feel personally much safer using my credit card in those instances and even with these big stores that even though that they've had hacking problems and that I'm gonna shop there all the time because that's what I do mm -hmm. on Sunday morning they had a clip that there's this new thing they're doing is that they are reading a man walks by and he can read your, your sure. car key um, insert and can unlock your car just go over unlock your car get in it can even start your car up and drive off with your Oh, I this is new to me, too. but I don't know the technicalities behind it. I don't, but, but if they, it's the same kind of instance where the cards, the credit cards that have the antennas, 
um, very similar. It's called near field technology. So you can buy something on the black market, put it in your, it's like sending out a, 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 a I call it a ping, and it's, it's trying to get your information from the near field technology with the cards. Um, not all the cards have uh, antennas, and if your card has it, you, it will look like a little Wi-Fi symbol on the front of your card. That, that means that you have near field technology. You don't have to shove, and you don't have to swipe. You can be at, let's just say, 7-Eleven uh, and pay for something and just tap the machine. It's, it's one, basically one electronic reading another electronic like mm. that. Um, in regard to starting your car, my guess is similar technology. I haven't really mm -hmm. done a lot of research on that, I but believe it. if they're doing it in one area, they're yeah. sure going to do it in another. I mean, I've heard yeah. that you can do it with um, different technology that's in your home, different technology that's you know raising your. I mean, it's just it's crazy what can be done. Mm -hmm. I want to make sure we get this, and Sorry, then we'll go yes. back here. <laughs> that's how the law was written in, I think it was 93 or 94. I don't know why it was written that way, but that was just how the law was written. So what is it that was secured um, with, uh, for, your, for your home that's not secured? I think it was getting information for the... Uh, Th this is for the home improvement contractors. Yeah. So okay. if you're going to do work on your personal mm -hmm. home, mm -hmm. you, the contractor doing the work on your personal home has to be registered through our office. Um, because that's how the law was written. I don't know why that's how it was written. But if, so if you would like to do work, they, you can call us to see if that man or woman is registered and to see if there any, has been any issues with that person um, to keep you safer. It also keeps the contractor safer because sometimes contractors have problems with homeowners who don't want to pay them. So mm -hmm. we have a program that we can bring them in and say, homeowner has an issue with the contractor and we'll bring an arbitrator in. Um, in other words, this whole arbitration process would only come into play if it's your own primary home. Your personal primary home. home. Correct. If and it's if a vacation it's home, you'd probably have to actually go to an attorney first um, and attorney. bypass us because the law was written only for okay. your personal home. You hmm. can still find out all of the information. Yes, you uh, absolutely still get information. Yes. Um, and my other question was, uh, and this is peanuts compared to some of the things I've heard here, but my current credit card. Mm -hmm. It says CA behind it, uh, one of the names. I assume California. I called uh, three times at least, and nobody ever answered the phone. At least one time, they said uh, this this uh, number is not valid or something like that. You contacted the number that appeared on the statement. Yeah, I would contact the you contact your credit card company. Mm -hmm. it's, it's the, if, if it says CA, I would assume that was Canada. Oh. Um, so I would contact, if they're not, and especially if they're not answering the phone, mm -hmm. um, you can Google the phone number. Yeah. Um, and if it's a scam, it'll pop up. But I would call your credit card company and say, hey, I don't recognize this this charge. For, it's only $25 that we just fine, but that's right now. And that's if they want to do this in three months and say another 25, 50, 75, 100, um, and they can look into it for you. Um, and that's often what happens with phone numbers that come in is that if you notice, if you ever tried to call them back, it's a busy signal or it says this number's not in service, or, and that's because they're one-way phone, uh, phone numbers that these scam artists have, have created. So if it's popping up on your statement and you're trying to call that number and it's like that, then I would be a little wary and I would absolutely call the bank and, and sort of let them take it from there. Um, I just want to grab this. Oh, sure. Any sort of um, any sort of business or company that is promoting that they're going to protect your identity or anything like that, all we can really do because we can't advocate one way or another is say just do it, just do your research. I would venture to say that there's going to be a lot of information online um, or with review sites like with, with Better Business Bureau. Contact us and speak to one of our information specialists. We won't say yes, you should choose them or no, you can't. But we'll say, look, these are the issues that consumers have had if there are any, or you know what, we haven't had any um, consumer complaints against this business or anything like that. So it's just about finding the one that's that's right for you, and um, it doesn't mean that it's good, it doesn't mean that it's bad, it just means that we can yes. advocate one way or another. <laughs>
for it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Why are you two in separate organizations? Why aren't you together? Because we wanted to work together. <laughs> That's a good together. question. Why <laughs> That's a good know. question. <laughs> Well, it, we, uh, there's, um, for the most part, the community relations department that I'm a part of at Better Business Bureau does something similar to what their community, uh, to what Consumer Affairs right. does. We're a nonprofit organization, though, Better Business Bureau in general, and of course, we're just, you know. We're still a nonprofit, we're a state agency. Oh, yeah. So, a, yeah. a state agency under the governor's office, mm -hmm. so a lot of times if you have an issue, and the BBB can't deal with it, and it's not something that we can deal with it, we can call the Attorney yeah. General's office on behalf of you and say, they have this, that is connection. An, this is an AG's office, you should call them. I don't know why we're not together, but we yeah. decided to actually to do these presentations together because we have so much combined knowledge. Mm -hmm. and a lot of times, um, if you as a consumer have an issue with something, um, if you're going to try to hire a, a contractor, you can look on Amy's site, or if you have issues, Amy can call our mm -hmm. office and say, you know, what, have you heard anything about this specific contractor? Mm -hmm. So we do work very well together. It's an extra validation, too, because we tell people, you know, obviously when you look at a business review on BBB.org, your research doesn't necessarily have to stop there. You can go and take it a, little, a step further, and that would be contacting their office or, or vice versa. We always say, you know, it doesn't have to stop at that first place that you, that you find that little piece of information on. Find uh, another resource tool as well. And it's, it's great because our resources are free, and that's the biggest thing. We just want to know that we can find good educational information, and we don't have to pay for it because we shouldn't have to do that, but to be able to share. And something similar to what I was mentioning earlier, that a lot of people have heard of the Better Business Bureau, and they think to call us for the after effect. We want people to start using us beforehand. But with the Office of Consumer Affairs, since I've met Robin, um, she had mentioned that she doesn't she has found that a lot of people don't even know that they exist. So some people know to call us, some people know to call them. So being able now to sort of combine our talents and um, share information, which is something that we've always done, but now we get to educate on the same, um, the same subject matter. That was a good question. Mm -hmm. Sure. Uh, well, I think if you have a contractor who's going to do work on your house, mm -hmm. they're supposed to get a work permit from the town. I, yes, yes, absolutely. So you could call and see whether this person actually Yes, absolutely. That's, I mean, first and foremost, making sure that they're licensed and that they're certified to do whatever it is that they say that they're going to do. And making sure that the contract, of course, is valid and that it has all the stipulations in it that you want it to have. And then before they even start the work, making sure that with the town, they're actually registered to be able to, to do that work. Mm -hmm. yeah. So independent, independent people like you know, the school teacher that is going to do work by himself. Mm -hmm. That's a good question. If it's an independent, like um, an independent business owner, in terms, of, I, I, I would, would say that yes. I wouldn't hire anyone that didn't have their own insurance yes. policy. That's that's a personal they thing. They should because you don't want someone up on a ladder mm -hmm. um, and breaks their neck mm -hmm. suing you. So if if you're going to check that information, it's not enough just to see, have them you know, wave something in your face. Take a picture of it with your smartphone or write all the information down. Mm -hmm. Call the insurer. Because we have seen instances where people have whited out and re-photocopied uh, if it's expired, if mm -hmm. it's not even under their name. Or mm -hmm. they say they have a policy that's this big and their policy is this big. Mm -hmm. um, so if you're going to even do some business with a small mom and pop place, see what their insurance policy mm -hmm. is. What, call them d uh, directly. Don't just rely on, oh, I saw the paper. Mm -hmm. so, and it, so You would ask for workman's comp mm -hmm. uh, evidence. Mm -hmm. I, would, I, I guess I would, I, I would ask them, what is your insurance policy? Do you have an insurance policy to be on my property? You mm -hmm. could also call your own insurance company and mm -hmm. ask them um, what, if you're using a mom and pop who's not a big business, what is your, what would be, what would qualify in your policy to cover him in case he fell? Mm -hmm. I do both sides and, and see. Because um, maybe you're not covered, maybe he is, maybe he's not, maybe you're not. Mm -hmm. I would call both sides to see. And it's one of those better to be safe than sorry. Well, thank you so much for allowing us to be here today. You're a great audience. Lots of good questions, actually. <laughs>